Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books, in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Charlotte McConaughey to discuss Once There Were Wolves. Uh-oh, I got the wrong one. Here it is. This is an amazing book, and if you don't already have it, you should immediately get it. And then you can read her first book, if you haven't already. Um, she's the author of the, no the novel Migrations, a national bestseller that is being translated into over 20 languages. Charlotte is based in Sydney, Australia, from where she joins us this evening, and we're delighted to have her. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Lori Frankel. Lori is the New York Times best-selling award-winning author of The Atlas of Love, Goodbye for Now, and Reese's Book Club and Hello Sunshine book pick, This is How It Always Is. She lives in Seattle with her husband, daughter, and border collie. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions that you can post using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen and you can order your copy of Once There Were Wolves from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi, Charlotte. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Lori. Hiya. <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. <laughs> Hi, Laurie. <laughs> Congratulations on doing this. Um, this is an amazing book, and I'm so, so excited we're talking tonight. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate your joining us at the crack of dawn tomorrow from lockdown. <laughs> it's actually a very reasonable hour of 9 a.m. <laughs> oh, perfectly reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> to be up and have your hair done and, and look gorgeous <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> no. uh, well, okay, so here today, this is, we're still on today. So we're still on your book birthday. and. Um, and therefore, I think people haven't read this book yet, which I'm almost jealous of them because I, well, I just read this for the second time and I loved it just as much as I read as I did the first time. But there's something really magical about reading a book that you love for the first time. And so um, it's really, it's very exciting for, for all of you out there who have not read the book yet. Um, you have a real treat in front of you. And I wondered, since nobody but me has read the book yet, if you wanted to start us off by um, telling us a little bit about it and maybe reading a little bit and then I've got tons and tons of questions and then we'll take questions from the audience so if people have questions start writing those down um, and in the little chat where it says ask a question and and we'll get to as many of them as we can great sure okay so once there were wolves is the story of uh, biologist Inti Flynn who arrives in Scotland in order to uh, reintroduce 14 grey wolves into the highlands there um, to rewild the forest um, and she faces quite a lot of pushback from the locals because it's a quite a densely populated farming community and she has she's brought her twin sister Aggie along with her who's kind of suffering from some trauma that we don't quite know about and Inti's hoping that getting out into the wild will uh, heal her. Um, and then the body shows up and <laughs> Inti knows that uh, the wolves are likely to be blamed. So she kind of does a bit of a reckless, uh, crazy thing in order to protect them. So it's a story of, um, it's, a, it's a, a, a bit of a crime mystery. It's a love story, a story of family and sisters. I think ultimately it's a story about rewilding not only a landscape but but ourselves as well so i'm just going to read uh, a couple of pages from very close to the start because i think that's probably the, the simplest way to go <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, now in a different part of the world the dark is heavy and their breathing is all around the scent has changed still warm earthy but muskier now which means there's fear in it which means one of them is awake. Her golden eyes find just enough light to reflect. Easy, I bid her without words. She is wolf number six, the mother, and she watches me from her metal crate. 
Her pelt is pale as a winter sky. Her paws haven't known the feel of steel until now. I'd take that knowledge from her if I could. It's a cold knowing. Instinct tells me to try to soothe her with soft words or a tender touch, but it's my presence that scares her most, so I leave her be. I move lightly past the other crates to the back of the truck's container. The rolling door's hinges rasp as they let me free. My boots hit the ground with a crunch. An eerie world, this night place. A carpet of snow reaches up for the moon, blowing for her. Naked trees cast in silver, my breath making clouds. There was meant to be press here for this, government officials and heads of departments and armed guards. There, were meant to, there was meant to be fanfare. Instead, we have been hamstrung by a last minute motion meant to delay us until the stress of this prolonged journey causes our animals to die. Our enemies would have us keep them caged until their hearts give out, but I won't have it. So we are four, three biologists and one vet, stealing moonlit into a forest with our precious cargo, silent and unseen, without permission, the way it always should have begun. There's no more road for the truck, so we're on foot. We lift number six's container first, Niels and I taking a back corner each while Burley Eben carries the front of his own. Amelia, our vet, and the only local among us will remain here with the other two containers to keep watch. It's a little over half a mile to the pen and the snow is deep. The only sound Six makes is a soft panting that signals her distress. A loon calls, distinct and lovely. I wonder if it stirs her, that lonely cry in the night, a recognition of the same ancient call she makes. But if it does, then she doesn't reply in any way I can interpret. It seems to take an age to reach the pen, but eventually I make out its chain link boundary. We place Six's container inside the gate and head back for the other two animals. I don't like leaving her unguarded, but very few know where in the forest these pens have been placed. Next, we carry male wolf number nine. He is a massive creature, so the second hike is harder than the first, but he hasn't woken from his sleep, so there is that at least. The third wolf is a yearling female, number 13. She is Six's daughter and lighter than either of the adults. By the time we've carried 13 to the pen, it's nearly dawn and exhaustion has set into my bones, but there is excitement too and worry. Female number six and male number nine haven't, have never met. They're not from the same pack, but we are placing them in a pen together in the hopes they will decide they like each other. We need breeding pairs for this to work. It's just as likely they'll kill each other. We open the three containers and move out of the pen. Six, singularly conscious, doesn't move. Not until we retreat as far as we can without losing sight of them. She doesn't like the scent of us. Soon we see her lithe form rise and pad out onto the snow. She is nearly as white as the ground she walks so lightly upon. She too glows. A few seconds pass as she lifts her muzzle to smell the air, maybe taking note of the leather radio collar we've placed around her neck. And then, instead of exploring the new world, she lopes quickly to her daughter's container and lies beside it. It stirs something in me, something warm and fragile I've come to dread. There is danger here for me. Let's call her Ash, Evan says. Dawn burnishes the world from grey to golden, and as the sun rises, the other two animals stir from their drug sleep. All three wolves emerge from their containers into their single acre of glittering forest. For now, it's all the space they'll be given, and it's not enough. I wish there didn't have to be fences at all. Turning back for the truck, I say no names. She's number six. That that's probably a good place to stop. Mm. <laughs> it's I mean it's a perfect place to stop. It's also it was a really good passage because it does a really nice job of uh, showing what's so great about this book because you introduced it with with all of the plot and intrigue. But there's also the fact that you are just a beautiful writer. And, oh, um, and that really showed it off. Okay, so tell us about these wolves. Um, why, just for starters, why, uh, tell us about, I guess, wolves in general and, and your wolves in particular and, and why, why wolves um, was the animal that you chose to, to drive this one? Well, yeah, so I didn't initially know a great deal about wolves before I started researching this book. I mean, I, I think I've always loved them um, as a lover of fairy tales and mythology. There's something very kind of um, mysterious and beautiful about them. But I didn't know until uh, this book of the power that they have. Um, they're essentially... They're called keystone species because they have a trickle-down effect on every other animal um, 
in their environment. So it, basically what they do is they come in and they move along the overpopulated herbivores, mm -hmm. which are eating all the tree shoots and kind of stopping them from growing. And that allows the trees a chance to grow and thrive and it brings a whole lot of different other animals back into an ecosystem. Um, and, you know, they have such power that they can move the course of rivers and regrow forests. And as soon as I kind of knew that, I just knew that I sort of had to write about them because they're such incredible creatures, but we have such a kind of insane <laughs> response to them. You know, they, they generate so much fear and hatred despite the fact that they're such essential creatures and, in fact, they're very sort of shy and family-oriented and uh, don't pose much of a threat at all against humans. So that's sort of where all of that started and mm. I kind of had this idea that I wanted to write about um, a woman who was kind of using the wolves to bring a forest back to life. Yes, this blew my mind, I have to say, um, the first time I read your book and, and I realized that it's fiction, but it, it definitely sent me to the internet to find out everything <laughs> I could because this is a really remarkable idea that the way to um, save a forest and, and a and indeed a climate and, and indeed a planet is to start with the apex predators, um, to start at the top rather than, than at the bottom. And indeed to, to kill some deer, which, yes. is a, which is a really remarkable um, thing. And in fact, this idea of rewilding runs through, runs through the whole book. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you're right. It is really fascinating that, uh, the top of the food chain, which we kind of, you know, have been told for centuries is the, the dangerous part, is actually what regulates an ecosystem and, and creates its biodiversity. And, you know, we've made such a blunder over the last centuries by killing so many of them off that we've done irreparable damage and it now falls to us to, to reclaim a lot of the environment or the land that we've kind of taken over and give it back um, to natural spaces and, 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 you know, using wolves is such a kind of simple and elegant solution <laughs> to this issue. Yes. Well, yes. Although not, maybe also, not simple. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. You do a really good job of, of showing how it isn't simple. And the other thing that I really appreciated is that you do a a beautiful job of um, very elegantly speaking for the other side too, very tenderly showing that the farmers who are very upset, um, who have livestock to tend and a way of life to maintain and, a, and their own culture to maintain um, are legitimately terrified mm -hmm. of, of, this, of, of this idea. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's that's true, you know. There's a huge amount of pushback f on this idea of of bringing wolves back into a space because they do they frighten people a lot. And there is an assumption that wolves are dangerous violent creatures not only to livestock but to children and and people and and that you know they make a space kind of impossible for humans to inhabit. But we've seen in a lot of places all over the world that in fact, um, it is possible for us to share the space. Um, it, it's very possible to have farming and wolves in an environment. Um, but I, but I, wanted to, I wanted to be true to the fear that I think is very reasonable um, and, and to not create a sense of I suppose blame and um, division. I would always prefer for my writing to be um, encouraging a sense of togetherness and um, harmony, I suppose, between the, the two sides of this issue because, you know, everyone's dealing with their own problems. The farmers have huge financial pressure upon them. Um, we have to kind of work with them instead of, you know, blaming them for this issue. Yeah, yeah, and you, I mean, this is what I always want to read is is 
books where there is an argument on both sides and and then let's look at both of them and you and you do a beautiful beautiful job Thank you. Um, yeah okay and let's talk about how how Aggie but it really especially Inti um, how they have to be rewilded really over the course of this thing too yeah so I guess this is a bit of a more complex Yes. <laughs> idea, the idea of rewilding ourselves and rewilding people and and I didn't maybe fully even know what what that meant for quite a while as I was writing this um, but Aggie and Inti have both been kind of um, badly damaged by a trauma that they've suffered which you don't sort of find out about until a bit later in the novel um, and I really liked the idea that reconnecting with nature in a way is such a healing force such a powerful thing in people's lives um but and i think the kind of i i guess the general idea of rewilding ourselves is not necessarily maybe to to lose control of ourselves but it's to find a balance and a harmony with the world around us that perhaps we've forgotten about. You know, I don't think humans are very good at that. We're not very good at um, being in, in harmony with the rest of the world. We kind of have separated ourselves and um, we, we tend to like to dominate it, I think, um, instead of harmonizing with it. So I, I guess the idea of kind of reconnecting back in with that side of ourselves is what allows both Inti and Aggie to to heal from this this painful thing that they're kind of running from yeah yeah I mean they're both such interesting characters Inti is I mean she's so smart and she's so strong but she doesn't like play that nicely with others and <laughs> and that's I mean it's some of what's so so really wonderful about her but it is this striking contrast with wolves I mean she loves these wolves and and she admires these wolves but what what really struck me is that she's like she's jealous of these wolves <laughs> she's like, um, and indeed they have a much uh, simpler closer family structure um, than she does and um, and they know they know something about um, when when safety comes from going deeper into the woods rather than mm. than leaving the backing off of the woods, which is um, you know which is sort of her what she has to to find. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Inti? Sure. Yeah. So she yes, yeah, she's kind of. <laughs> <laughs> where do I start? Yes, where do you start? <laughs> <laughs> She's a compl complicated woman. She, I guess we meet her as an adult um, and she's very prickly. She's, um, I think in a way she's lost her faith in people. Um, she's very angry. Uh, uh, you know, she's witnessed so much harm being done by people to the natural world but also to each other. Um, and so we kind of get a sense that she's really she's she's been damaged by something. She's she's turned into her sister's protector in a way, um, which is quite different from how she she starts her life as a very empathetic child who um, is very open to connecting with other people and trusts easily, sees the best in everyone. Um, and I think that's kind of an idea that she gets from her naturalist father, who's very kind of. Um, well, he, he speaks about kindness and, and living lightly upon the earth, whereas she's got this very different mother <laughs> who is kind of this gritty, hardened crime detective in Sydney and she sees the worst in people and, and kind of teaches Inti that she needs to, to, to be tough and to create a bit of a shell in order to protect herself um, and to not be so vulnerable. So Inti has a bit of a transition, you know, from this child into the woman that we meet as an adult. And I think you're right. Yeah, she definitely, she loves the wolves, but she she, she can never get close enough to them. She can't, okay. she wants to be one of them, I think, in a way, because they're, they, they live with a simplicity. Um, they're very loyal and loving to each other. And I think that's what she kind of wishes that people could be more like. Um, and, and we'll come to recognise that we can be more like that and we are more like that. She just has to allow 
you know, um, herself to kind of see that again, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was so struck about the, your description of her family versus the way the wolves do family um, versus also you bring in the trees and the way that the trees do family. And, and that's a really interesting spectrum. Yeah, I loved the idea that there were these kind of invisible connections happening beyond what we can see. Um, I think trees have that. They have a they have this extraordinary, um, I guess, symbiotic connection to their to the rest of the environment around them. The same in a, in a similar way to how wolves um, kind of inhabit their space. And I really liked that. Inti and Aggie, her sister, her twin sister, would have a silent language of their own that would reflect these silent languages of the trees and of the wolves um, and, and just kind of, yeah, I guess allow a bit of space for the magic of all of that. Yes. <laughs> well, it is very magical. It's, it's very interesting to me that you, you said fairy tales before because there are lots of wolves in fairy tales and lots of wolves in myth, but but wolves aren't actually magic. Wolves are real, and yeah. and it's something that we forget. And um, and I just appreciated you pulling us back to that all through this book. Like, don't get too far. Come back. Come back. <laughs> and actually, speaking of the other thing that that seems very magical, um, you know, but isn't necessarily is Inti's mirror touch, mm -hmm. and and, um, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. I I was. Um, this refrain of don't look, if, if you don't look, this won't hurt, mm. that is sometimes very good and sometimes very, very bad advice. Yeah, yeah. So Inti, Inti has a condition called mirror touch synesthesia, which um, as you said, seems really magical, uh, but is, is very real. It's a rare neurological condition, which means that whatever physical sensation she witnesses, um, she will feel on her own body. So somebody else getting slapped in the face, she will feel the sting of that on her cheek. Um, and it's something that she, yeah, her relationship to that condition changes a lot over the course of the book. But as a child, she kind of is able to see it as a gift of connection um, and something that opens her up to the rest of the world and to people and to animals. But as she gets older, she starts to, um, you know, the more she sees and feels, uh, the more dangerous it, it starts to seem to her. Um, and to the point that she needs to kind of try and close herself off to it, I think. Um, and that's that's that sort of closing off to empathy that the book is really about. And, um, you know, that I guess that that general theme of empathy and its lack and what that does to people and, and, and kind of makes them do. Yeah. Yeah. And the tension between um when you face things um, and take matters into your own hands and when the thing to do is to is to try to back off um, mm. and and let things have their way and and how that's different with with wolves versus versus trees versus humans um, is something that you you balance really beautifully throughout oh, <laughs> throughout this. Um, there are lots of different, you talk about lots of different, well, you don't, the characters in this book have lots of different paths to ways to do good in the world. Mm -hmm. um, her mom's ideas versus their mom's ideas versus their dad's ideas versus the people that she meets in, in this town um, versus her, her own versus her sisters. Um, this is a really interesting book as far as making an argument for ways to ways to do the most good in the world, ways to protect the earth. I mean, as climate fiction, um, mm -hmm. let's talk a little bit about, about all of those ideas and the way they um, speak to each other. Yeah, sure. I think, yeah, so obviously creating a, a, a big rewilding project like this is in a sense about as big as you can get in terms of, um, acting on behalf of the planet you know this is a big big project to take on which changes a lot of people's lives and takes 
takes a lot of expertise. But what I think is also important to acknowledge is that there are much smaller ways to make an impact. And I wanted to kind of show that in the, in the other people um, and in the other characters. And there's a, there's a scene where there's an, uh, one of the old Scottish ladies that Inti meets is kind of explaining that, you know, we don't just have to take on these really big projects. We can also um, do tiny little things um, day by day to make an impact, such as planting flowers in your garden for the bees um, or whatever it may be. You know, we can start small and get bigger. And I really like that idea because it kind of, I, th I guess it just brings up our responsibility as people on this planet that we all do need to take um, take some sort of action. Uh, and, of course, you know, <laughs> A lot of the damage is being done by people who are much higher above us um, and that's, that can be very frustrating. Like I find that extremely frustrating. But there is, I think there's power in also looking at, okay, how can we be, how can we live best? How can we make our impact a positive one? And, 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 and it's also reflected in how we treat each other um, and not just on what we're doing to kind of regenerate the planet. Yeah, and I really loved that. I I think so much climate fiction, so much really wonderful climate fiction, it, um, is is post apocalyptic, and so it's they're very good books, but they're they're very heavy. I, I feel like I they, they weigh on you while you read them, and they weigh on you after you're done, and that's important too. Um, but you have done a really you have. You have approached this in a different way, and I really appreciate it. It is it is empowering, and it is uplifting, and it is human, and 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 um, heartening. I think in a way that um, that that we need climate fiction to be right now. Yeah, thank you. That actually makes me really happy because that's sort of, you know, one of the one of the main things that I I want people to feel when they read my stuff is is that sense of hope and energy and. Um, passion and reconnection and 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 the notion that time you know isn't up we we don't have to we, we can't give up yet yes we can't give up yet right that, <laughs> yes. yeah perfect um <laughs> well and the other thing I, I guess along those lines that really cheered me even as it's a little frightening is that you um people in this book are kind of skirting the line between um madness and like courage or or bravery and and so some of the things that seem like they're the former you you've sort of bent them towards well okay what if we what if we looked at that at, at, admirably what if we admired that as as courage um is that a very fine line you think totally i think so <laughs> i definitely think it can be i mean <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, it's obvious to Candy because it is here. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that's exactly what you've done. Um, you know, and similarly, like this question of are we safer alone or in packs? Mm. Um, yeah, I, and that was something that I really, I guess, when you've got a character like Inti who is so separate from other people and wanting to remain that way, wanting to kind of remove herself from society. You know, she thinks society is the poison of everything and that and we're kind of, we infect each other with yeah. um, violence and um, harm. And it's a reasonable thing for her to think really after what she's been through because there's a lot of there's a lot of really bad stuff that she's kind of experienced and seen so it makes sense for her to sort of feel that way but it was important that this book be for her about understanding that we 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 need nature but we also need people we need yeah. our packs um and we need to be able to trust each other um, the way that wolves do, you know, she takes a lot of inspiration from them. Um, yeah, well, and she had. I think we all can. 
Which we, yes, I mean, for sure. I, she had me, well, once she had me flirting with my dog. I just felt like <laughs> over the course of turning the pages, my relationship to my dog changed completely. <laughs> and she also had me thinking like, oh, I should move to the Scottish Highlands. Yeah, you know, me too. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so, okay, so this is my next question is, what kind of, what kind of research, what kind of travel did you, did you do to, to get this book written? Well, I mean, I'd been to Scotland a handful of times before that, but just as sort of, um, you know, holidays to kind of explore a little bit of my own long back Scottish heritage. Um, and then <laughs> I did. Your <laughs> How Scottish you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, I went back there for a specific um, research trip which was lucky it got squeezed in before all the pandemic stuff happened um that was the october before that all started and it was just the most amazing trip i just kind of my partner and i just hiked around uh, mountains and through these little forests that remain um, you know there's still beautiful forests in scotland that have been there since the ice age um, but they're dwindling very quickly and that's kind of the main issue at play here but so yeah so I did I did a really gorgeous kind of trip to get a sense of my geography I suppose and to try and imagine where the wolves might be and or they might go or um, you know the best kind of places to situate them and then I of course did a huge amount of reading research on on rewilding on working with wolves on using wolves to um, or reintroducing wolves um, the Yellowstone project in the 90s was extremely informative because um, a lot of the biologists who worked on that have actually written first-hand accounts, which are amazing. Everyone should go and read them. They're mm. kind of extraordinary. And, and what was so fascinating in those accounts is the way they interacted with the wolves in a very complex way and, and could see that these wolves have incredibly unique personalities they're like people in a way and they have their own adventures and you just sort of can't help falling in love with them and i'm sorry say that last part again you can't help falling in love with them oh with these <laughs> wolves. i mean yeah. yeah because it's so interesting the whole um you're, you're, they they become these additional characters in this book, um, as actually does does the land itself become this additional character. And I think that um, that's a thing that gets thrown around by literary types all the time, like this <laughs> idea of, you know, like you've done such a good job with the setting that it becomes a character. But in this case, it's more like the forest has has agency. It, the, the trees have, have desires and needs and 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 conflicts and and villains, um, you know, who are trying to destroy them, and and they are they are us, um, and it's it's just a remarkable it is a it is a remarkable read, therefore, um, because this book is populated by by characters who are speaking to us in in really all all sorts of different ways. Oh, that's yeah, that's a beautiful way to look at it. I I um. I, I think that was that was really important um, because otherwise it's sort of like, well, how do you invest so much emotion in in these animals or in these inanimate sort of plants and trees? You've got to bring them to life in a way that's real, in a way that they really are alive um, and living their own kind of amazing existences. And I wanted to I wanted us just to be able to see the the very edge of that. Um, and take some kind of beauty from it all. Yeah. Well, and and because there are so many characters in this book who speak with languages that are other than out loud, we we therefore are willing to to invest agency in in all kinds of living things that aren't um, you know people per se. Yeah. 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 Oh. That beautiful language of plants and trees. <laughs> they, I mean, they think they've got beating, uh, scientists are now saying that the trees have beating hearts, which is just so beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. This, book is, <laughs> this book changed the way I looked at everything. I mean, and uh, there are some books where I really love them, but then when I finish reading them, I look at the world and it is the same. And this is not one of those books. This is a book that, <laughs> that changed the way I looked at the world when I was done. And that's a really remarkable gift. Well, thank you. That's 
very, very meaningful. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are supposed to take questions at this point. So people have to ask questions and I'm going to read them. Um, I have lots more though. So if people don't want, if you feel shy today, then <laughs> then, you, then that's fine. You don't need to worry. But, um, but let's see if we can do some, especially because Pam here has already asked a couple of questions. Um, one of which I'm dying to know myself, which is the, the jacket, um, which it, the, the jacket cover, which as soon as I saw it, I thought, this is an amazing, it's an amazing <laughs> jacket cover. Um, you want to talk a little bit about about that? I know it's always a, a difficult a difficult decision. Um, well, I, in fact, not so much a decision, but all of the moving pieces. You want to talk a little bit about the cover? Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, I agree. I absolutely love it. We had um, a very different approach initially, which I think happens with a lot of books. You know, you come out with um, sure. original covers and, and they don't, take or they're not quite right um, and so we kind of went back to the drawing board for this one and the I was presented with two equally beautiful um, covers one was kind of a bit more Scottish Highlands-y oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know some mountains and a little kind of hut in the in the distance <laughs> <laughs> which also felt really nice but this one to me was just I couldn't stop looking at it. It was really calling me into this kind okay. of, yeah. yeah. I just want to be in there. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. It's like you can walk into this book. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so that was, I couldn't, I, I had to pick that one. It was so beautiful. And look, it wraps around the spine. Yeah. So it goes all yeah. the way around. It's like woods, woods all around. <laughs> yeah. I haven't I actually got my copies yet, Laurie. Oh. You've got one before before me. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what happens when you live in Australia. <laughs> I put mine in the mail to you. I have notes all over it. I took, I took tons and tons of notes. Um, in my little scrawly handwriting, I'll send it to you. Uh, I'm sure they're on their way. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're coming. <laughs> all right. Okay. Here's the next question. Everybody is still also thinking of questions that they want to ask. So this is a question from Jana who says, were there any particular books or authors that inspired you for this book? Your discussion of trees has me thinking of the overstory, the Richard Powers. Yes. That's, that's a good connection. Um, and this engagement with wolves and sisters has me thinking of dual citizens. Thanks. And also she adds, loved migrations. Can't wait to read this one. Oh, thank you. Um, so Overstory, yes, massively um, kind of influential in terms of thinking about, um, I guess, not taking the th things for granted and looking at trees but everything um, in a different way and allowing it to kind of have its own life and existence. Um, I would. I read a lot of, as I said, I read a lot of um, first-hand accounts from the Yellowstone project, which were really important um, kind of reading just to allow me to sink into that space um, and, and kind of what the day-to-day -day life was. Um, some of those, I think, Douglas Smith, uh, Decade of the Wolf, um, Oh God, there was lots. I can't really, I can't remember them all. I read a beautiful um, uh, nature book by Jim Crumley called, um, I think it's called The Scottish Wolf, but he writes beautifully, um, beautiful nature writing and, and kind of was able to imagine Scotland with wolves again, which was a really nice way for me to kind of uh, access that as well. Um I, I haven't read Dual Citizen, but it sounds like I should. <laughs> I haven't read um, Dual Citizens either, yeah. but it sounds like I should. <laughs> yeah. And then always, I always come back to this um, time and time again, I always love to read Mary Oliver poetry because she just yeah. writes so beautifully of the natural world and our connection to it and how nourishing that can be. So she's, she's always kind of one of my go-to um, when I'm trying to get into the right <laughs> mood or headspace. Um, Although, yeah. as long as we're here, um, do you want to talk about the epigraph, which was which sure. is Mary Oliver? Um, yes. Speaking of, I mean, Angela Carter couldn't Angela be more Carter. inspirational on this point. Yeah. Oh, she's fabulous. I she's love the way she, she she does fairy tales with such a kind of yeah. just gritty modern edge that I just love. So, yeah, I, I had to choose the, the quote, which from her was 
one beast and only one house in the woods by night. <laughs> what you're saying. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Anybody who have not, if you have not, um, if you have not Angela Carter, you should do. Uh, yeah. Because yeah, there's there's lots of it, and it's all. Mm. Um, magical it's really uh it, it is it, i think that we we sort of throw around this like fairy tales for adults um but these are fairy tales for adults yeah. uh, <laughs> they are and they are hardcore yeah. um all right okay so pam's other question which we talked about a little bit but we're going to talk about a little bit more um twin sisters inti and aggie were both very vulnerable and extremely strong how did you come up with these two characters and develop their relationship in such a way as to propel the plot so powerfully, which indeed is a nifty trick? <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, I guess that's always the challenge. Um, it's, uh, I guess, that balance between character and plot, um, which I, I, and it's important to me to always use both. Um, so I think. Uh, they were, they kind of came to me, uh, it took, they took a while, I think, for me to kind of really get to know the sisters and to sort of figure out how they fit into this story. And I think they, I started to see them as kind of, uh, I guess, yin and yang of each other in a way. Mm. Um, they, you know, Aggie starts out as the kind of fierce protector um, and Inti's the kind of very vulnerable one and then they sort of actually sw swap um, in the middle of the, all their lives at the start of the book um, and Inti becomes the kind of fierce protector whereas Aggie's a bit more, um, I think it was, it was important to allow space for the narrative of the trauma survivor who is uh, more fragile and more vulnerable because we often see the narrative of the trauma survivor who is very strong and tough becomes hardened. Um, so I, I wanted Aggie to kind of represent something slightly different. Um, and I think they both kind of represent that idea of tenderness and gentleness versus harshness and violence. I suppose that this book is trying to kind of um explore and so you know as the plot kind of pulls them along I, the, it, it, it needed to be challenging the way that they kind of interact in the with the world um and and pushing them to both transform I don't know if that answered the question. <laughs> I, I think it does answer the question. And it is, I, and, and I really appreciated that. I think that indeed that's really important that um, so often we want the narrative to be like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And, um, and that's really difficult because it means that not only do you have to survive trauma, but you have to you have to come out of it being this, you know, strong, uplifting person. And that is, it's asking an awful lot. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, some, some people do respond that way, but a lot of people don't. Yeah. And it's important to, I, th I think sometimes acknowledge that. Yeah. Yeah. And you did a remarkable job. All right. Okay. Christina wants to know birds to wolves. And so what's the next, what's the next one? What's the, what comes next? Um, and more broadly, um, what do you think of cli-fi and your place in the genre? Yeah, that's something I'm kind of grappling with a little bit at the moment. It's such a funny genre. It is. <laughs> I think, and it's also, I mean, it's slightly problematic to turn it into a genre, I think. Um, because this is not something that we are having to suspend our disbelief over. Okay. It's a very real, real hard reality thing that we're all facing at the moment. And so I guess in a way relegating it to, to genre kind of talks about it in, I guess pr presents it as something that, is you know we have to try and stretch our minds to believe like a lot of genre fiction um and i think also writing about climate can fit into any any genre um it doesn't have to just be its own space i don't know i'm still grappling with it all <laughs> and how i feel about the the kind of 
the title of the genre and whether or not I feel like sometimes it, I feel pigeonholed into it a little bit because yeah. I think my books have a lot of different elements and they're kind of hybrids of a lot of things and sometimes it feels like, you know, just talking about that element um, reduces it but maybe not, yeah. you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, what well, was the uh, question? <laughs> Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> the well, first part of that again. question was birds to wolves. What? What? Yes. Next? Yeah. So next probably is whales. <laughs> oh, okay. What kind of whale? Uh, um, humpbacks, I think. Oh, very nice. Yeah, but also sea creatures. Are you know? I'm. I'm. The next thing I'm writing is um, set on a subantarctic island, <laughs> which is getting swallowed up by the ocean. So it will have a lot of kind of beautiful sea creatures, seals. I love seals. I just mm. adore them because I love selkie mythology. <laughs> oh, so there'll be yeah. seals. There'll be whales. Um, there'll be a family on stuck on this island as it's being swallowed up um and it's going to be i guess a story about raising children in a in a damaged dying world and what our responsibilities are around that and what we choose to save and why yeah well and i think that that speaks to what you're just talking about which is if you're going to write about children or your families or really you know humans on this planet then then you then you ought to be thinking about about climate. Um, this this no matter what you're writing about, um, these this issue has become pressing and and unignorable, um, yeah. and and therefore not not genre. Um, we 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 care not to pigeonhole you. We want you to write about whatever you want to write about. <laughs> you're, doing, you're doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I'm kind of doing it to myself too <laughs> because I keep <laughs> choosing these topics. But <laughs> yeah, um, well, and there it is a it is a remarkable um, like it is really interesting to read a book and learn about. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's just like watching a nature documentary while reading a mur murder mystery while, <laughs> um, you know, trying to um, tease out relationships between sisters. I mean, it's a lot going on and that's yeah. exactly what we want out of out of our novel for the moment. Um, yeah. All right. So um, next question. Can you share a little bit about your formation as a writer and the, like the structure of both of your novels, how they move back and forth in time and are like a puzzle that you piece together and discover? Sure, yeah. So, okay, so I started out writing um, genre fiction, fantasy and sci-fi, um, and that's what I kind of grew up reading and loving and that's so therefore that's what I wrote because I've always believed that you should write the book that you want to read at the time that you write it. Um, and so that there was a lot of playing around with form in those early novels for me, um, particularly with the kind of dual timeline um, or the non-linear narrative structure, which I really like because it it when I I think when I shifted into fiction, just straight fiction, I felt a little bit constrained by it um having come from such an expansive kind of <laughs> space where you can write whatever you want and there's a lot of you know jumping between characters and places and times that tends to go on so i really enjoy bringing over that kind of um that structure um into my fiction because i it felt like it kind of freed me up um, when you're just within one one character's point of view, mm. it can get very intense. Um, <laughs> and and I was finding myself getting stuck a lot. And so what was freeing me up was mm. being able to kind of move between, uh, for Franny and for Inti in both of these stories, being able to move between their present day and their past kind of lives to sort of, I also think it really helps build tension. Um, you yeah. know, you can create a bit of mystery around, okay, well, you know, she was like this back in the past, so how is she like this now? Yeah. <laughs> What's happened? <laughs> um, which is, you know, hopefully a good way to kind of keep <clears throat> keep people reading. Um, and I think also building those two timelines to... Uh, climaxes that kind of 
feed each other mm -hmm. in a way is a really good um, kind of way to, to create catharsis really and to kind of build a big, big kind of final moment um, if you've got these two sort of narratives that are doing the same thing, feeding this kind of big finale. Um, so I suppose that would be why I, I kind of gravitate towards that, that narrative structure. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I'll always use it. <laughs> it might be getting a bit repetitive. Well, I mean, you were, it's, I mean, this, these books are both like a master class. And among other things, you, you managed to do it in 250 pages. Or like, there are some people <laughs> who pull that off because they're reading 600 page books, but you, <laughs> yours are so perfectly tight um, that they not only are doing those back and forth dual narratives, but they, they're doing it they're doing it quickly and efficiently and um it is it is remarkable to watch oh thank you well i mean I, I, <laughs> thank you. I also have a bit of a, a training in screenwriting so that probably also um you know feeds the that idea of brevity and and yeah. kind of getting to the point <laughs> yeah and and that there has to be plot to go along with your characters which yeah we really appreciate as readers. I, <laughs> I, 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 I love it. I love it. I'm, um, I, I should say I'm sitting on the floor because I'm in a weird vacation house because I'm, I'm away on holiday <laughs> with my family and I've made everyone in my house read this book. I've hand, oh, see, I'm not sitting in front of it anymore. I've hand sold like six <laughs> copies of this today just to people I'm related to. Um, and, and you know, there are a wide variety of people and this is what everyone says. Like, I want there to be a plot. I, I want it to be smart. I want it to be character driven, but I also want there to be a plot. Yeah. Totally, right. I'm the same. Your lovely and brilliant editor, Carolyn, has this to say. Charlotte, can you speak about a particular and intimate relationship Indy has with the wolves and the tension she feels between not wanting to anthropomorphize them and yet mm -hmm. seeing them as incredibly intelligent, emotional beings? These are great to have editors. They <laughs> ask like the perfect question. <laughs> yes, that is an amazing question. Um, and. Carolyn and I have talked about this a little bit. I think, yeah, there's this reluctance in the scientific community to anthropomorphize creatures. Um, and I, I mean, it, it makes sense, I think, in a way, because we don't want to sort of, pro uh, I guess, project ourselves onto these creatures and assume that they kind of experience the world the same way that we do. Um, but I think it's very difficult not to as well. Um, Inti in particular, so she has this rule about not not naming the wolves. She uh, only gives them numbers, which I think is a, is a way to distance herself from them because the world is such a dangerous place for wolves and the sad thing is they don't end up living very long most of the time. Um, so you have to assume that you're going to lose these wolves that you're trying to um, protect and, and, well, yeah, um, care for. But over the course of the novel, she kind of can't help herself from, <laughs> I guess, in a way, falling in love with these these wolves and and thinking of them as as her family members and 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 people in their own rights. Um, and that's why she starts to think of these this this one particular wolf um, as Ash and gives her a name, um, which she knows will be dangerous for her, but um, she kind of can't help. And I, I think it's. Yeah, there's there's something kind of well, it's very human, I suppose, to to assume that or to give creatures human qualities. But then again, um, you know, why why I guess why shouldn't we as well? It's sort of a it's a loving act, I think, in a way, um, to kind of to think of them as as equal beings or or just as worthy of kind of names and love as we are well and the wolves as you have them earn it they they are very smart and they're very loving and they have developed these relationships with one another i mean as opposed to for instance the deer which you have me talked into like <laughs> screw the deer who even cares about those deer <laughs> Kill them all. <laughs> and, and that is, you know, that is um, so that so that we're only actually that that anthropomorphiz anthropomorphization, the anthropomorphizing we do <laughs> only, it only applies to like some of the animals. Um, 
because be, because those wolves are um, are really remarkable. I mean, in in many ways, they have figured out a lot of things that the humans in this book have not um, yeah. at a personal level, but also at a like at an evolutionary level. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're the ultimate survivors, aren't they? They're really fascinating creatures and they actually can survive anywhere on the planet. They don't need yeah. forests, they grow forests. Um, and I think I've always kind of had a bit more of a, I've always felt more for the predators than the prey for some reason. I think yeah. <laughs> it's because the predators are constantly starving and fighting for their lives in a way that prey animals are not. You know, they they sort of, they exist, uh, I think, far more easily in the world, <laughs> which is why we, we have so many more of them. Um, and so I kind of, you know, every time I watch David Attenborough, I'm always going for the, the, the predators <laughs> to get them. <laughs> get them so they're not going to starve to death. Well, but and you, I love deer as well. They're beautiful too. Well, sure, we need yes. them all. <laughs> Let us not throw shade at the deer. But <laughs> um, well, and of course, we humans occupy both. We we mm. are we are both of those things. Um, not necessarily in the in the natural world, but certainly in the interpersonal one. And yeah. um, and so we identify. I identify with the wolves and the deer. Yeah. Even if you Good. talk me out of the deer. All right. Much <laughs> as it, <laughs> I do feel like the wolves and Carolyn should get the last word, except for Jana has another really good question. So we're going to ask that one too, because um, we're going to get in just under the wire here. Um, she says, I'm a big audiobook listener, and I'm wondering if you had any involvement in the choice and production of, of narration. And um, also, such an interesting question do you listen to them? Do you listen to the audiobook afterwards? I actually can't. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I, do you, Laurie? Do you listen no. to your audiobook? Yeah, Never. it's 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 not because of the you know the production's amazing, the narration's always amazing. Um, it's just I can't listen to my own writing read out. It's too embarrassing. It's, very <laughs> it's a very strange. See, I mean, you I listen to it enough to say, wow, they did an amazing yes. job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is like being inside your own brain, which is a weird yeah. place to be. <laughs> and it's diff it's strange having a different narrator than your own right. thought. Yeah. It's just a very disorienting experience. So I, I can't listen to them. But um, it, I did, you know, I mean, we don't have a huge involvement in the production. Um, that's kind of the amazing audio production team that they, they do all of that. Um, and they, I think, uh, at, yeah, they sent an audition from Saskia, yeah. who is the narrator, and I thought she sounded great um, mm -hmm. and gave the okay, and that was probably the extent of my involvement in it. And then also giving them a whole lot of um, pronunciation help. <laughs> oh, I bet, yes. Is she Scottish? She, no, she's um, she's New Zealand, actually. And okay. so she, she had to do an Australian accent for the whole book, oh, which she yeah. did an amazing job with. I mean, I get the two, the pretty similar, the accents, but yeah, she did a great job with it. Oh, I do want to listen to it. That's me. <laughs> it's impressive. The accents are impressive. Um, <laughs> all right. And this is also a, a good question. It has to be the last one probably because we're out of time, but film rights. What's the story with film rights? Uh, we, there is stuff going on that I can't talk about yet. <laughs> so, but it's in the pipeline and Hopefully, one of these days we will have a lush, gorgeous six part crime TV series. Can't wait. <laughs> or a movie. We can't or might, a movie. Might be either. I can't <laughs> wait. What about migrations? What story was that? Uh, that's still chugging along. Um, we've yeah, we've sold the option to the the film rights, and we've got a director and a screenwriter on board. So they're yeah, they're going to be working on on all of that side of things and trying to get financing. Really, um, yeah. that's always the battle. If you can yeah. get it financed, you can make it. But it's that's the really difficult part, <laughs> and it takes a long time. Yeah, these must be um, expensive books to, especially migrations. Yeah. yeah, you can't do that on a in a black box theater. That requires a, a whole thing. It'll, it would be an epic movie. Yeah, it would be an epic movie. I would tell the first hour it opened, it would be amazing. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> All right. Um, Christina's going to come back on and tell us to get off the internet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm going to say what a fantastic conversation. Thank you. Um, I also think that both of the books have like really strong love stories. Yes. Uh, there are just yeah. so many elements here that I love and just kept me enraptured. And it, it's the kind of they're the kind of books that you just want to come back to, you know, at night. It's just like, oh, my God, you know, here I am. I can fall into this world. Uh, and that's what you've done. You've created these, like, wonderful worlds with all of these, all of this food for thought and, and so many beautiful, you know, just, it, it, they're just great. So I don't want to, like, you know, stumble <laughs> my way through this. But they are fantastic books. I want to thank you for being part of our virtual bookshop here, joining us today, both of you. Um, thank you to everyone watching from wherever you are all over the world. I think someone put one more question in there. Should we check it out? <laughs> There's either one more question or a comment. Right, it looks on. like. Thank Wait. you. It's a thank you. Oh, oh it is. You. Thank you. Thank you. My Gracious <laughs> is one of my favorite books. Just got Once There Were Wolves and so excited to read and listen to it. That is a really good note to end on. You should be so excited. It is the best book. You're in for Aww. a treat. You're in for a treat, Sally. Thank you so much. I, I hope you, you got it at Books and Books. Yeah, oh, me too. I hope you got it at Books and Books. <laughs> anyway, stay well. But, I hope we'll see each other in person someday soon. Yes, that would be lovely. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Oh, thank you for having us. It was so great. And thank you, Laurie. Lovely, lovely chat. It's really good to see you. Have a good day ahead of you. We're, we're all going to go to bed, but you have a good day. Yeah, okay. <laughs> good morning. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.